on Sky News Australia. This is the Rita Panahi Show Overtime. Welcome to the Rita Panahi Show Overtime. Coming up today, we'll bring you the latest from Israel. I'll be crossing to Tel Aviv to speak with Yosef Haddad, an Arab Israeli, a former IDF soldier who has some shocking revelations about what captured Hamas terrorists are telling their interrogators about the October 7 attacks. We'll speak to our US correspondent Josh Hammer about the Biden White House setting a new record and no, it's not one they want publicised. Kinsey Schofield will bring us the latest royal and celebrity news. I'll have a big, huge edition of Lefties Losing It. And as always, we start the show with the biggest local international news. Let's get started with Verve Communications Director Prue McSween. Prue, thanks for joining me. Um, let's start with Israel and we're starting to hear accounts from journalists who have been shown body cam footage of Hamas's October 7 terror attacks. I'll be speaking to Yosef Haddad later who, who was one of those journalists who, who saw that Horrific footage, um, and uh, we are starting to get reports reporting on on what they've seen. I want to show you this tweet from Andrew Neal, who says journalists are in tears as IDF shows them body cam footage of massacres by Hamas terrorists on October seven, with civilians and soldiers being shot, stabbed, tortured, and burnt merely because they were Jewish. Their corpses were bound, gagged and riddled with bullet holes and knife wounds. In one clip, a Hamas terrorist throws a grenade at the father and his son. The blast kills the father while the young boy is covered in his blood. The child is dragged inside and forced to sit next to his brother, whose eye is a bloody mess after being subjected to horrific torture. One of the boys sobs, why am I alive? Prue, the... Uh, the subhuman savagery of Hamas is indefensible, obviously, and yet we are seeing so-called intellectuals in the West trying to rationalise these attacks. Well, the problem is that, Rita, the Israelis haven't been... Uh, waging the propaganda war that Hamas has. And we have intellectuals or pseudo-intellectuals and, of course, uh, uh, left-leaning media who are very happy to accommodate this propaganda that Hamas is, is putting out. And it's sad to say, but these horrific uh, imagery, images that have been shown to selected journalists really need to be shown more broadly because we're hearing one side of the story. One cannot underestimate the misery that the Palestinians in Gaza are going through. Uh, that is mainly and only the, the fault of Hamas, who they voted in years ago and now seem to be uh, accommodating. You know, when you look at the misery that they are experiencing now and have been for years, it's all attributed to Hamas. And I think that Israel needs to go on the front foot because it's only going to get more bloody we know that this propaganda war is going to continue as Israel goes into Gaza. So I think we need to make sure that, well, Israel needs to make sure it tells its side of the story. Let's focus on the media for a minute. And just when you thought The Guardian couldn't sink much lower, they give us this front page and headline. Uh, Pressure intensifies on Israel to negotiate release of Gaza hostages. Uh, Prue, uh, the Guardian, well, they're predictable, you've got to say that, and consistent. Uh, when they hit rock bottom, they just start digging. Well, they're doing exactly what Hamas wants them to do and what's the wants the media to do. You know, add pressure to Israel. You know, the world is doing that already. Uh, they are not looking at it from the perspective of uh, what Israel has gone through and has gone through for since the gas chambers in what seventy five years ago. And I just feel that you know we need to understand where Hamas is coming from now that they're releasing drip feeding a few uh, hostages for humanitarian purposes. 
Hamas wouldn't even think about human humanitarian uh, issues. You know, they've shown that they're barbaric and don't have any regard for human life. So it's all about the politics and the propaganda play for Hamas. And Guardian and other lefty uh, media are just, you know, accommodating this. Useful idiots, that's what they're called. They're the, they're the useful idiots of... Uh of tyrants and, in this case, terrorists. Now yes. to a, a, another shining moment of journalistic integrity from The Guardian. Here is their fair and balanced reporting on the Argentinian election. <laughs> Bad and dangerous Argentina's Trump on track to become president. And, of course, their picture fits as well. Uh, I mean, their Trump derangement syndrome pro extends to... Every conservative now, we, we saw the same thing happen to uh, Georgia Maloney in, in Italy, the mm. hideous reporting about her, and she's gone on to be possibly the most popular European leader at the moment. And uh, the reporting in Argentina, not much better. Exactly. You know, look, most of us with a brain read The Guardian just for amusement. It's like, you know, they, you know let's have a little <laughs> laugh. But, of course, there are people who do believe that anything that's published is real. And, uh, of course, they're going after this bloke. I don't know how to pronounce his name, Milai or something like that. But... You know, he's, he's touted as, you know, apart from, uh, you know, one of the Trump acolytes and, and a Trump lookalike, uh, that he's a bit like Elvis Presley and Wolverine. You know, anything they can do to disparage someone <laughs> who's coming in uh, to try and relieve the 40 per cent of the, you know, these uh, uh, population there who are in poverty. So, you know, anything they need, what they need is a total shake-up like J Trump is has proposed and tried to do from America. But, of course, that's uh, grist for the mill for the lefty uh, media. I mean, if that was under opinion, I'd go fine. It's, it's someone's opinion. This is an opinion program. We're sharing opinions. But that was a news report. <laughs> and news reports are supposed to be completely fair and impartial, devoid of any uh, ideological uh, bent from, from the writer. You know, your opinions are not supposed to be reflected in a news story that you're doing. But these days, the lines are completely totally blurred. blurred. <laughs> uh, now, South Africa continues to uh, show us just troubling uh, signs that they're becoming more like Zimbabwe every single day. Mm. And their third largest party in South Africa has vowed to arm the terrorists of Hamas if they, if they were to take power. This is uh, Julius Malema. He said anyone condemning Hamas were cowards and he even compared these terrorists to Mandela. When you are oppressed, the only option you have is to fight. And that's what Hamas is doing. They are fighting for their freedom. Mandela did the same thing, took up the guns and fought for the freedom of the people of South Africa. When you are oppressed, you only have one option. Confront the enemy and shoot to kill. Do not kiss the enemy. Peru, this is the same uh, leader, political leader, who told a packed stadium uh, of his followers to kill white farmers. In fact, they sang and chanted about it. Uh, it's a worry. It's a worry that <laughs> you've got this bold, proud support of a terror group after they've committed this unspeakable atrocity on mm. a mass scale. Look, the world needs to wake up and look, at, look around, you know, the politicians like, uh, you know, well... Biden uh, and others for in the Western world and look around and see all these madmen who are, are really brainwashing uh, people and have this power. You know, this is a guy who wanted to nationalise the mining industry. He is so dangerous and yet, you know, thankfully he's the third uh, most popular and let's hope he never gets in. Well, there was an attempt to do something about him uh, and to at least have him charged with some sort, to have the kill the Boa chant, declared hate speech. But mm. in South Africa, I think it was their Supreme Court, they determined uh, that wasn't hate speech. So uh, you can chant about killing white farmers, even as white farmers are being uh, routinely killed and, and attacked. 
uh, and it, it's not considered hate speech. So there you go. No, I don't think anyone's going to be taking them out. Um, I think uh, I think that was our first taste of lefties losing it. I think we need a bit more. Let's start lefties losing it in lefty heartland of DC. And here we're going to see a man in a dress chanting for Palestine. Mm. Free, free! Palestine! 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 Now, I do not have to tell our learned viewers what would happen to that man or any man in a dress if he walked down any street in Gaza. It would not end well. And Prue, uh, what these people don't seem to understand, that the, that the only place in the Middle East where alternative lifestyles uh, are protected, where these people have some rights, is Israel. And yet they are so against the only Jewish state and the only place where they would be safe in the Middle East. Yeah, it's it's astounding. You know, you, you look, we don't think they have much intellect. We've never thought that about these people, but they've clearly been brainwashed or maybe they this is the fault of an education system that they don't understand history. They're not aware, aware of what's going on in the world. Uh, they're happy to latch on to any bandwagon that they think, you know, poor things might need their support. It's making them feel good about themselves because they have have no intellectual identity, uh, self-awareness. It's really tragic, but they're so dangerous. Well, they're, they're just idiots who have bought into this neo-Marxist neo -Marxist notion of oppressor and oppressed. They've decided the Israelis are oppressors and the Palestinians must be the oppressed. So that's who they side with. Never mind that uh, their lifestyle would see them... Uh, beaten, jailed, perhaps even killed if mm. they were to set foot in Gaza. Now let's uh, watch Democrat Ilan Omar have a bit of a freak out here when a journalist asks her squad colleague about why Israel shouldn't take action against terrorists who behead babies and burn entire families alive. How many more killings is enough for you? Is it a thousand more? 2,000 more, 3,000 more? How many more Palestinians would make you happy if they died? Do you, you, will you be fine if all of the people of Gaza were gone? Would that make you happy? Would that be the thing that makes you proud? And maybe that's the question you should ask Richie. Is he okay? How many more Palestinian lives is he comfortable with? Because I am not comfortable with any more. I mean, she should be posing those questions to Hamas, who put their headquarters and uh, store their ammunition in hospitals and, and put the, uh, their rocket launchers next to playgrounds. I mean, they're the people you should be addressing those questions to. Now, let's go to this lefty losing it. Don't ever ask the left to explain themselves or even the signs they carry. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. What happens to Israel? Curious. Oh, please don't touch my microphone. That's not okay. We, you're not going to tell us what happens to Israel? Will you tell us what happens to Israel? If Palestine is free from the river to the sea? What does that mean? Settler colonialism is the real terrorism? Prue, we know what that line, that chant that we've been hearing in Australia as well means. It means there is no Israel. It means there is no Jewish state. It means ethnic genocide. So if you're going to carry that sign, then I think you should own it. Well, it's they're just moronically parroting words. They don't really understand the fact that apart from the fact that I think they both were smoking weed before they actually went onto the streets, they're so out of it, uh, or unless that is their intellect. Maybe they're just showing how stupid they are. But, you know, they, they had no idea. They couldn't explain themselves. They're just, you know, poor things who have latched onto a bandwagon, like the idea of that little catchy, uh, you know, from the river to the sea, and, you know, off they go. They're just mindless fools and dangerous. They are 
dangerous, mindless, useful idiots. Uh, now to the UK where police will arrest you in your own house for misgendering someone or posting a transphobic limerick on Twitter. But uh, chanting about jihad and killing Jews seems to be tolerated. But police did confront these young men who were seen with a British flag, uh, the St George Cross here, and gave them a stern warning about any naughty behaviour. Let's listen to this exchange with the constabulary. For the moment, anything racist or even close no, to racism no, is right. said. Oh, I've been said. Right. Right. Hang on, no, no, no. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Right. Right. The moment anything gets anything close to that, all right, people are going to start getting arrested. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. It's just this just a verbal warning to let you know we're all on the same yeah. page. And staying in the UK, let's have a look at what happened when someone brought a pride flag to a pro-Palestinian rally in London. Uh, I can tell you the flag did not last long, obviously. It was uh, uh, dealt with in um, some fairly brutal circumstances. Yeah, the, again, the, this is not just uh, lefties losing it, but these lefties turning on each other. Staying in the UK, here are some lefties triggered by British symbols. Look how many police officers it takes to protect a man hold, holding a St George flag. <laughs> Now let's have a look at these charming individuals removing images of missing Israeli children taken hostage by Hamas. Now, that is happening not just in the UK, but across the US and elsewhere in the West. And I could show you literally hours of similar footage, hours. It's depressing. But there is a fight back. And I want to show you these two New York lefties and how they react when they're confronted about removing posters of missing women and children. Do it. I'm a citizen here, and this is American citizens. You got it. You're not going to do it. Get the out of here. This is American citizens. Got kidnapped. You get the out of here. Put your back. Get the out of here. American citizens. You bitch. American citizens got kidnapped. That was in Brooklyn. You get the feeling that couple aren't used to being challenged. Uh, now to New Jersey, where an anti-Hamas billboard has been removed after around 100 calls to police. I don't know why. This seems to be entirely accurate. The billboard reads, oh, don't be naive. Hamas would chop your head off too. I think that's a message a few people need to actually comprehend. True, uh, not sure why police were being called here when... Uh, I would say that is a harsh, but a statement of fact, a harsh statement of fact. It is, but the problem is that the police force, forces around the world are politicised now, and they're also worried about being litigated against and hauled over the coals. It's all about PC now, and it seems that the most vocal minorities are the ones that are going to be accommodated. Uh, it's all, you know, when you look at all those, those previous um, losing it clips, you can see that 
there, it's a result of indiscriminate immigration policies where people are allowed to come to countries and they will not adopt um, the practices and uh, the, the culture um, and the privilege of being a citizen of that new country. And, you know, they're never going to assimilate. They're never going to accept that uh, what may be a, a, a Christian a values uh, community uh, is acceptable to their standards. And this is why we are having all these confrontations and unrest. It's, it's concerning, really concerning, and I don't know how we're going to ever solve the problem. Now to Sydney, where pro-Palestinian supporters were eager to link their cause to the Indigenous cause in Australia. These protests have included welcome or acknowledgement of countries. Uh, they've had uh, Aboriginal flags and speakers have spoken about the evils of colonialism. Now to the climate catastrophists who feel entitled to stop traffic. Sometimes traffic fights back. This bus driver has clearly had enough. Now let's check in on these lefties losing it after someone is misgendered. That college education is worth every cent and this next entitled gal agrees or, or maybe not. I have a bone to pick with America! So I'm headed to my serving job. I hate it. I hate it. Be why I make more money serving. I have my literal business marketing degree that put me in a cute $80,000 in debt. And I make more serving sushi rolls because I was, I've been applying to marketing jobs for weeks now. And the, the pay cut is insane. Insane. Ah, oh, that's Alison Johnson from uh, Huntsville, Alabama. And she posted that her herself on TikTok, so she was complaining about her college degree not immediately resulting in a six-figure salary. She seems to think a college degree means you don't need any sort of work experience. But the jobs that are like a cute 150 to 200,000 a year, I'm not getting those. I'm a 20, almost 25-year-old, my birthday soon, almost 25-year-old chick going against you know, corporate ass America, people with so much experience. All I got is my degree. You know, people say, get your degree, but then they don't talk about how you need experience. The degree was the experience! Honey, relax. Oh dear, Prue, I mean, the entitlement there, I mean, she's doing that rant in what is obviously a very nice new looking car, but put that to one side, if you've just graduated, you can't be expecting to walk into a job that pays 200000 if you've got no <laughs> industry experience. A college degree does not mean you don't need any industry experience. 
Well, believe it or not, Rita, kids present to me from uh, university with university degrees and they are expecting to earn big money and they're useless. You virtually have to unlearn them. <laughs> I'm, I'm much, I prefer people who have never been to a college because the people teaching them in those <laughs> colleges have never had any industry experience. So that, Sheila, stick to your sushi, kiddo, because you ain't going to get a job, I'm sure of it, <laughs> with that attitude. <laughs> oh, Prue McSween, always fantastic to have you on the program. Thank you for your time today. Joining me now is CEO of Together Vouch for Each Other, Yosef Haddad. Yosef, I'm pleased to have you back on the program, but sadly it is under such terrible circumstances. You're in Tel Aviv. Uh, there have been reports in recent hours from Tel Aviv news channel I-24 that according to their sources within Gaza, a potential hostage release deal is currently being finalised with Qatari mediation playing a key role. If the deal is struck, it would see Red Cross receive a group of about 50 hostages who hold dual citizenship. Well, first of all, it's unacceptable to the Israeli society here. That's for sure. Uh, we've been uh, hearing about this, by the way. Uh, today, Hamas uh, released another two hostages. So to, in total, we have four hostages been released from uh, uh, Gaza. And uh, people are talking here about releasing another 50 with dual citizenship. And uh, the Israeli citizens here are uh, uh, absolutely shocked because for them, uh, you cannot and you shouldn't negotiate with the terrorist organization ISIS Hamas. That's their name, by the way, and everybody in the world should call them ISIS Hamas. Uh, therefore, uh, we uh, urge the uh, Israeli government uh, and the leaders here to release uh, or the immediate release of all the kidnapped uh, Israelis who were kidnapped by the terrorist organization uh, Hamas. And this is something that uh, is widely accepted uh, by, every, uh, by the majority of the Israeli society. Now, let's talk about the reporting on this conflict, the unprecedented attack by Hamas and the counteroffensive by Israel. Some of the reporting has frankly been putrid, uh, and I'm talking about the likes of the New York Times, Washington Post, our ABC here in Australia, and perhaps most prominently that other taxpayer-funded giant, the BBC. And uh, I want to play you this clip of former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, who had obviously had enough. Watch this astonishing exchange with a BBC anchor. Last week, a uh, hospital was... Uh, uh fired by Islamic Jihad that fired a rocket on it, and BBC said that it was Israel, but it wasn't Israel. And I understand that BBC has taken a side of uh, uh, on the Gazan side, because all your questions are only about the Gazan civilians. That's not you true. You haven't asked one that's question. That's not you true. You haven't asked one question I, I began about by those children. The, from the very beginning of this interview, from you the very just are asking me about them. Mr. But Bennett, it seems that, that is you not care true. little about our side. Oh, it is. Mr. What Bennett, I began, I, began, our side? I began by talking about the hostages. And what I'm asking you about now is... No, I'm not talking is, about the hostages. I'm talking about the babies that were murdered. And you keep on caring only about one side, but that is the BBC way. But uh, let me let me tell you something. We're here protecting you. You're, we don't need your protection. And if you think there's a, a balance here between two equal sides, then you are lacking moral clarity. And BBC, I must say, is lacking moral clarity. What you guys did last week, shame on you. Yosef, uh, why are so many in the Western media willing to believe what Hamas tell them? Do they really think a group that is capable of uh, torturing and slaughtering women and children is uh, not going to lie to them? You know what? It's even more than that. Think about the fact that, take a, take a media outlet like BBC, and I ask a simple question. Where is your uh, um, honesty? Where is uh, what we call it real journalism? where you call it being a reliable news source. Because what BBC has been doing in the latest uh, or in the last two weeks is literally being a biased, one-sided, with a terrorist organization that massacred. And I saw that, you know, on, on the stripe, you put 1,400 Israelis. Uh, I know that this is the official number right now. Unfortunately, 
we are still counting bodies. And from sources that I have, we're talking about another few hundreds of dead Israelis. That's the atrocity that happened on the 7th of, uh, of October. Now, what's happening in, in the international media, at least some of the international media, it's kind of like a game for them. They see it as a game. They see it as we want click bites. We want to generate more and more people to enter so we can have better ratings. We can have a better uh, selling uh, commercials on, the, on our websites. And what a better way to do it than just, you know, paint the, the uh, Palestinians as the one who are victimized by the evil and the strong Israeli uh, uh, IDF uh, 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 army and, uh, of course, uh, the country. I mean, uh, just look at, look at look, not only just look at how the BBC is actually working. This is something is quite unbelievable to see even how Al Jazeera and other Arab media outlets are working. You know what they're doing to the Arab world? They are brainwashed. And for those who don't know, I am an Arab Israeli. So my mother tongue language is Arabic. So I follow the uh, media in, in Arabic. I follow the social media in Arabic. And what they're saying there is unbelievable. They're completely lying about absolutely everything. They said that Israel bombed the hospital until today. They haven't issued any correction. Uh, nobody said anything mm. about the fact that it was the Islamic Jihad who did that. Nobody said about the fact that Israel did not bomb a church in Gaza, because until now, the Arab world thinks that Israel bombed the church in Gaza. And nobody knows even why, why Hamas is hitting cachet whip weapons under a mosque, and we have the proof for it. So these things we're seeing throughout mm. the uh, some of the international media, a lot of the Arab media, and you cannot uh, not see that they are biased. But you know what? I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for giving me also the opportunity to send the message that Hamas is ISIS and what they have they do what have they been doing for us uh, since uh, the 7th of October? You know they are you know making making uh, humiliating us and they're humiliating us not because uh, it's of course it's because of what they done on the 7th of October but it's also because of what they're doing after that because after that they're trying to uh, paint themselves as a, they are a you know humane organization that they keeps their uh, kidnappers you know in a perfect uh, conditions and try to help them uh, we just saw footage when they released the two elderly uh, uh, women we just see them, you know, holding their hands and walking with the, with them, trying to uh, manipulative the, manipulate the world that they are, you know, humane. Guys, they are butchering us. They beheaded babies. They raped women. They killed Israelis. They burned them alive. They tortured their ba they tortured families. F parents watched their kids being tortured. Kids watched their parents being tortured. And then you want to tell me because of the footage of Hamas taking the host the kidnapped uh, uh, elderly people uh, f uh, hand by hand you're trying to show they trying to show that they're humane please if you fall, fall for that then you're nothing and I apologize for my words you're nothing but an ignorant you're nothing but an imbecile this is a terrorist organization what they're trying to do is brainwash you and trying to give you the idea that they are some way in some way humane they are animals you know what and if I'm saying they're animals I'm actually uh, uh, assaulting the animals they're inhumane, and this is what we need to do to say for everyone in the world must understand who they are. Don't get fooled by Hamas. I beg you. I beg you, don't get fooled by ISIS Hamas. They're a terrorist organization. Yes, if you attended a media briefing where uh, the media from around the world saw the scale of the atrocities Hamas committed, the Israel government took the extreme measure of showing the world's media vision of some of these crimes that have been seen across Israel after the, the poor reporting, after doubts were cast about reports of decapitated babies and families burnt alive. Uh, can you... Uh, Tell us about this briefing. Um, yes, uh, uh, you know, Rita, I've I've been uh, I've been seeing a lot of bad footages in the last two and a half weeks. I've been seeing footages that I don't wish anybody in the world, you know, to see. But today, it was something else. And for the last two and a half weeks, Rita, I've been very strong. I did not break. And uh, today, when the IDF exposed a 43-minute video of a raw footage from the GoPro of the terrorists 
GoPro cameras of the terrorists and from the uh, CCTV cameras were in the kibbutz and in some of the houses. Raw footages that were for the first time revealed by the IDF in front of a uh, 200 uh, uh, journalists from the international media. And what I saw there is something that I cannot comprehend. I, I want mm. to talk about the horrific uh, footage that I saw of uh, a father running away with his two kids, barely 10 years old, trying to go to a warehouse that was closed outside of their house. But uh, Hamas terrorists, they run after them. And in front of the two kids, they shot the father and killed him in front of their eyes. After that, they dragged the two kids inside of the house. The kid was shot in the eye. The other kid was injured. Both of them were injured badly. And the Hamas terrorist, they find a time to open the fridge and drink Coca-Cola. And at that time, one of the kids shouted, kill me why I am not dead. A 10-year-old kid is shouting, kill me. I don't want to be alive. This, some, this footage was seen by 200 international journalists. I beg the Israeli government, please release the footages. Release what I saw. The world needs to see this. Right now, I am the witness. Right now, this is my testimony. But there is, there is actually footage for that that can back up everything I'm saying right now. And the world needs to see what ISIS Hamas did to us. Do you understand how it was hard to see that kid begging to be dead? He wanted to die. Do you understand, Rida? That's the reality. And then the second, and then the second thing, please, that I want to share with you. Go ahead, go ahead. The second thing that I wanted to share with you is an actual record talk between one of the terrorists while he was in the kibbutz in the south of Israel, calling his parents in Gaza. He was so happy that he killed 10 Israelis. He said that. You can listen to that. Everybody listen to that. And the father is telling him, praise God. Thank you. Come back, and he goes like, I'm not coming back. I want to kill more. This is what we're dealing with. This is ISIS, Hamas, and I beg you, spread that message. And it's not only me, as an Arab Israeli citizen who's saying that. You have 200 journalists from the world are witness to what I'm saying, and they can verify that. And at the same time, I beg Israel, speak to the families, get authorization, and release the footage. The world needs and must see it to understand the ISIS Hamas. Please share this as much as possible. Yosef, I can't imagine uh, even just witnessing that uh, footage and, and those images are going to be burnt I into your mind. And, uh, uh, and I feel for you because it, it's incomprehensible, the cruelty that has been inflicted, unleashed on these innocent people, civilians, just on a Saturday morning. Um, we are seeing also footage at the moment of interrogation videos with captured Hamas terrorists admitting to committing some horrific atrocities. Uh, what have we learnt from these interrogations about um, what they did, who ordered it, and what's going to become of these, of these terrorists who've been captured? Um, you know, I've seen uh, several uh, investigations, um, and we understand uh, clearly Hamas wanted first and above to target civilians. They are not even hiding it. We know that even before they entered Israel, they on purpose drugged themselves and take drugs like cocaine in order for them just to go and make those atrocities and the massacres. We know that they got a direct order from their commanders, the terrorists from Hamas, direct order to kill as much as possible, to humiliate, to behead, to rape. They wanted to rape. 
They wanted to kill, they wanted to torture, and they wanted to behead it, and they wanted to kidnap civilians. That was one of the main targets. And another unbelievable thing that was found in one of the USBs on the terrorist, there are were their instruction in order for them to build chemical weapons in order to actually spread it in the south of Israel and later further continuing uh, 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 to to move on to the uh, to the center and even to the north of Israel. This is what we understand from the investigation. What I also understand in the investigation that uh, uh, some of the uh, uh, terrorists who were captured, they were uh, trying to blame everybody else beside themselves because you know they know that they're being caught and they know that they they are going to uh, face a severe uh, penalty and punishment. But make no mistake, just like Hamas, they're trying to, uh, you know, uh, give the image of uh, to the world that they are, uh, you know, uh, they are not a terrorist organization and they're a resistant organi organization. We're not, we're not being fooled by those uh, terrorists uh, as well. We know the reality. We saw the footages. We heard the voices. And of course, of course, we have still 200 plus kidnapped Israelis inside Gaza. And that's which brings me to my last point on that topic. Every time you see Hamas releases a footage of anyone who was kidnapped in, uh, and brought to Gaza, and you see the footage that they're treating them like human beings and treating them in, a, in the best way, I want you to ask yourself just one question. How those Israelis found themselves in Gaza. Because one of the girls that her footage was released, that she was being treated in the hospital, few hours before that, she was partying in the south of Israel. Hamas entered Israel. Hamas injured her badly. Hamas kidnapped her and brought her to Gaza. Don't get fooled by ISIS Hamas. Please, look at the full picture. Yosef Haddad, thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Now to the Golden State of Florida and senior editor-at-large at Newsweek, Josh Hammer, joins me. Josh, the past few weeks have really shown us the horrifying reality of the left's long march through the institutions. You wrote in the Daily Mail about this issue. You wrote the uh, the most prestigious universities in America. We're talking here about Harvard, Cornell, Columbia, uh, where anti-Semitism, the world's oldest and, as you said, most <laughs> politically correct form of bigotry, now pervades faculty lounges and campus quads. The last two weeks has certainly, Josh, opened the eyes of a lot of people across the political spectrum. Yeah, Rita, it was great to be with you. I wish we were under better circumstances, alas. But, you know, Jew hatred on the American university campus is not exactly a new phenomenon. What is new, I think, is just how bad it has gotten. It has gotten increasingly totally intolerable. I mean, I hear from friends who are in college, who are in law school and graduate school right now, that they are borderline afraid sometimes to just show up to class and to wear a Magen David, wear a kippah, wear any kind of indication that they are Jewish. I mean, look at the response to the Hamas war on Israel from the past two weeks. At Harvard, of course, you had 31 student groups sign this repulsive, disgusting letter saying that Israel bore the entire blame for the massacre, the pogrom inflicted on its own citizens. At Cornell University, another Ivy League school, you had a history professor by the name of Russell Rickford who said that he found it awesome and exhilarating to watch those Hamas jihadist mm. paragliders swoon in on this concert, mowing down 260 innocent lives, raping God knows how many others. And the list just goes on and on and on. There's a professor at Columbia University who said, who said something very similar. But it's not just the professors. Again, it's the students themselves. We've seen at least 30, I think closer probably to 35 to 40 students for justice in Palestine, student chapters all across America who unequivocally said they stand with, with, with Gaza, they stand with Hamas because this is justified resistance. Look, Hamas is indistinguishable 
from ISIS, Al-Qaeda, or any other genocidal form of Islamist Sunni jihadist outfit. It is a U.S. EU recognized terrorist group. And, you know, look, Rita, unfortunately, on the American University campus, there is a long and inglorious history of standing with forces of civilizational arson and, frankly, mm. just all out evil. I mean, go back to the 1960s, really kind of the beginning of the modern campus radicals. They were standing with folks like Angela Davis, Asada Shakur. I mean, they stood with terrorists back then. They defended Bill Ayers and the weather underground, the domestic bombings. They defended all of that back then. So, I guess it's only kind of the natural progression that they would get to where we are now, where you see legitimate defenses of genocide against the Jewish people on some of America's purportedly most prestigious university campuses. It, it's just appalling. Unfortunately, like I said, it is logically consistent. It is a logical outgrowth of where the left has been going for the past 40, 50 years or so. The only way I think this possibly stops is if people who have some sort of market power and can shift the supply and demand curves actually use that market power effectively. So to put some teeth on that, if you are a donor to an institution, you should not be giving a penny to any institution that has done anything other than unequivocally condemn Hamas and put the blame for this tragedy squarely on Hamas. If you are a parent, you should, be, you should not be sending your schools to these universities, no matter how quote unquote prestigious they are, if they cannot take a very basic stand on this sort of stark issue, this morally dichotomous issue of good versus evil. Finally, if you are an employer or a graduate school admissions officer and someone who signed on to these one of these appalling statements comes across your desk to be hired or admitted to graduate school, you should not hire or admit that person. So that is really the only way that, that the only way that this possibly ends, Rita. But unfortunately, as I wrote in that Daily Mail article, it has really been a very very, very difficult two weeks, I think, for Jews all around the world, just to see this this very ancient hatred rise yet again. It, it has been so ugly, and, and so many academics have not only sought to uh, minimise, rationalise, sometimes just straight out defend what Hamas unleashed on, on civilians on October 7, but They've also said more broadly, this is what decolonisation means. So we've been talking about decolonisation increasingly. Uh, what did you think it meant? As if that is, again, some sort of a justification. Uh, but I think a lot of eyes have been open, Josh. Those of us who pay attention to the modern left aren't terribly surprised. But I think a lot of people who are not that politically engaged are utterly shocked by what they've seen in the past two weeks and the reaction from, from the West. Now, let's talk about the Biden White House and their, well, losing complete control of the southern border. The latest numbers just illustrate that perfectly. Um, US Customs and Border Protection reports there were almost 270,000 migrant encounters at the southern border in September making it the highest single month ever recorded. They're, they're the ones that were encountered. There are plenty more who are not encountered crossing that border, but 270,000 encounters in a month is astonishing in itself. And their annual reports also uh, are setting records. 2023 fiscal year, there were 2.47 million encounters. That's the highest ever recorded in a single year. In fact, the Biden administration has now set the all-time record for uh, migrant encounters at the southern border. These are illegal entries for the last three years in a row. So 2021, there were 1.7 million, 2022, close to 2.4 million. And this year, uh, this financial year, we've seen 2.5 million, close to 2.5 million. Josh, these numbers are out of control. And we're talking about the entire population of somewhere like Pittsburgh crossing illegally every single month. Uh, what has been the response to, the, to this data? Well, it's absolutely out of control. I mean, you are totally correct, of course, to phrase it that way. By the way, going back to that final tweet of the Fox reporter, Bill Malugan, that we just showed the audience here, you, you saw mm. the market contrast from that to the final year of Trump's presidency, which was about a half million. I mean, talk about night and day here. Yes. But, you know, we're also talking about a time of an, of an emboldened global jihad right now. We're talking about a time when Jihadists, frankly, are marching openly in the streets in the United States of Chicago, Washington, D.C. They're marching openly in the streets of Europe, whether it's London, Brussels, Paris, you name it. They're right there, of course, in Australia. I saw that appalling footage of the folks going to the Sydney Opera House chanting to gas the Jews. So 
we're dealing with a time where I think radical Muslims all across the world are frankly more emboldened than they have been since ISIS had its so-called caliphate itself in Iraq and Syria. And that I say all that because that contextualizes just how important it is now of all times for the United States to control its extraordinarily porous southern border. In fact, I saw a number, I think it was a day or two ago, I think the number of of people who were caught at that border who were on the U.S. terror watch list last year was about 160 or so. And if that's the number that they caught, wow. who knows how many who knows how many let in? I mean, if they caught 160 to 165, maybe there are 100, maybe there are even thousands inside the United States interior right now. Who knows? There could be Hamas, Hezbollah, you know, or Iranian spy rings. Those people could be right embedded in our very communities. I mean, who knows what they're planning here if they were able to successfully plan what they did in Gaza two and a, two, two and a half weeks ago or so. So the situation from a security perspective is just absolutely atrocious. Unfortunately, I, I don't see a ton of signs of this administration starting to get it together. Yes, there was some chatter a couple of weeks ago about the about Joe Biden and Secretary Mayorkas, his ham-fisted Secretary of Homeland Security. There was some chatter about them finally starting to build some segments of a border wall. Thus far, I have not seen a whole lot of proof of that. They issued some sort of statement, but I have really not seen a heck of a lot of follow through. Look, Rita, ultimately, when it gets to the issue of illegal immigration, it, it, it is such a straightforward issue, which is one of the reasons why I find this so immensely frustrating. People respond to incentives. If you say that you were going to immediately turn back, if you were going to immediately send back to the country of origin someone who is trying to come across your border illegally or who's going to claim a bogus asylum claim, who is trying to cross because they are there for economic reasons, which is contrary to United States immigration law, that's not a legitimate asylum claim. If you say that you're going to enforce all that, then the cartels aren't going to take people because they know that, that they're not going to profit. It's not going to work. All you have to do is say that you are going to enforce the law as written. Donald Trump, to his credit, did that successfully. I, he could have gone a little further, in my opinion. The, the border wall, of course, was not successfully built in its entirety, but it was a much better start. Joe Biden right now, they are totally lawless. The door is wide open, and God help us, because like I said, oh, yes. we do not know the mid- to long-term security repercussions of this. Now, the question is, uh, will the dodgy house of Biden crumble at some point or will the uh, protection racket he's enjoyed continue? We've got uh, the son, Hunter, facing some minor charges. There's a lot more he should be indicted for, if you ask me. But we are learning some fresh details that raise even more red flags. The Daily Mail reports that Joe Biden bought another beach house and all in cash. We're talking... $2.7 million purchase here, uh, and it was within weeks of a text that Hunter Biden sent a Chinese associate demanding to finalise a $10 million a year deal. In that text, Hunter starts uh, the, uh, the text with, I'm sitting here with my father, and we would like to understand why the commitment made has not been fulfilled, and it goes on from there. Josh, I have plenty of questions here, including how a... Uh, crack addicted whore enthusiast with no discernible skills can demand 10 million dollars a year who knows i mean who knows how he was profiting i think it was eighty three thousand dollars a month roughly from barisma look i mean credit to congressman james comer of kentucky on the house oversight committee for getting this impeachment inquiry started a few a few weeks ago unfortunately there's there's really been no follow-up on this i mean i think many of us were actually excited to see mm -hmm what House Republicans might be able to come up with. They were trying to reach the apex of their powers. When you declare an impeachment inquiry, it kind of accentuates the House's ability to subpoena documents and all sorts of other abilities there. But there's been very little follow through. Of course, the U.S. House itself is currently in standstill because House Republicans seem woefully incapable of electing someone to be speaker. So I would like to see a little more progress on this. I happen to think that it is both the correct thing to do, morally speaking, and also happens to be good politics for Republicans if they can actually get their act together on this. But the American people, I think, are paying attention more when these stories come out. I mean, like, it, it's just been such a slow trickle, Rita, for years now. Every single data point we learn about how crooked and corrupt this family is when it comes to Ukraine, to Romania, there in Eastern Europe, of course, to, to China mm. itself. 
Hunter Biden has been indicted for gun crimes. And, you know, I've reviewed the relevant criminal statutes in the U.S. Criminal Code. It, it's extraordinarily straightforward. Under any definition of what those statutes actually read there in the U.S. Code, I think it's like 18 U.S. Code Section 922. I can't remember the exact citation. Hunter Biden is guilty, uh, for sure. I mean, I, he, you know, look, I mean, he's, he's, he's innocent until proven guilty. I mean, he will get his trial there. But if I understand the facts correctly, they fit the crime very, very well. So we will know. We will know just how much the gig is up, whether or not he gets off on those gun crimes. But the gun crimes, and here's the key point, those gun mm. crimes are just, a, they're really a distraction. They're a distraction from all of the international mayhem. Yes. I want to see Hunter Biden ultimately investigated for far off or possible kind of foreign agent registration act violations for all sorts of money laundering for tax evasion to me that is the more interesting stuff and the fact that we have not seen any movement on that either from the special counsel or again from the house impeachment inquiry to me that shows that there's a lot of work left to be done on this subject absolutely josh hammer thank you so much for your time today thank you rita now let's cross to Los Angeles where Kinsey Schofield joins us. Uh, Kinsey, it's a tale as old as time, but we have another case of Harry and Meghan being hypocrites. The Sussexes have been spotted disembarking a private jet after a luxury holiday in the Caribbean. Uh, Kinsey, for a pair of climate zealots who love lecturing the masses about global warming, this is not consistent behaviour. Prince Harry in particular has been uh, hectoring us about green issues and yet he certainly can't live up to the uh, standard that he preaches. That's right, Rita. Just think about the last six weeks. Harry flew to London for Wellchild. Then the pair flew separately to Germany for the Invictus Games. Then Portugal to see P Princess Beatrice. Then the Caribbean. Then we saw them exiting a private plane in Atlanta, Georgia. Harry was seen just this weekend alone by himself in Austin, Texas. You and I better watch our carbon footprint. But Harry and Meghan are the exception because one is the child of a king and the other is a deal or no deal girl. <laughs> now to a report on the ginger and the winger. That could be bad news for the UK if this is true. They, they want to move back to England apparently. This is according to OK Magazine. And it's Harry who is the one who is uh, eager to return to his homeland. A source told the magazine there is a divide between the couple on this issue, but they will soon start looking for a property of their own near London, and Harry is very much leading this. What do you make of this uh, latest report? Well, I do think that Terry had a really hard time when the palace rejected his request to stay there during the Well Child Awards. But I wonder how much having a residence has to do with him wanting to keep that Chancellor of State role that a lot of people would like to see him lose. I also wonder, does it have anything to do with his visa? Because he's not an American citizen. Um, so does he need to have a residence in the UK to maintain whatever it is he has in, in the United States that they're so secretive about. Um, but I do believe it probably adds there's some sort of fighting going on over it because Megan has no desire to be in the UK. She feels rejected by them. And, you know, she doesn't want to put herself in a position to be humiliated by them again, the way that they 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 booed her in the past when she was there for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. Well, I tell you, she didn't like the place when she was getting nothing but adulation because in the lead up to that wedding and, and afterwards, before they started behaving like utter brats, they were beloved. I, I remember that entire period because I was one of the few looking on going, uh, no, nah, this ain't right. There are red flags with this girl all over the shop. But I was pretty much alone there, Kinsey, I've got to yeah. say, because sure. people yeah. absolutely adored them. They adored the couple. The wedding was such a joyous thing for for the UK. And, yeah, if she didn't like it then, uh, can you just imagine what her reaction would be now that they're, they're just both very unpopular with the, with the public? Now, since the uh, Netflix series Beckham dropped, it's safe to say that... Uh, public have been loving everything to do with David and Victoria Beckham, but not Rebecca Luz, who was uh, David's former mistress. She's finally given her take on the series. 
the stories were horrible, but they were true. And he's the one who's responsible for all of this. He's the one who's responsible for his wife suffering. He's the one that decides to lie to her to say, we don't have to tell my wife. He's made all those choices. Was there anything particular that he said that on that documentary that? Yes, it was how awful it was to see his wife suffer so much. That bothered me. Why? Because he's the one that's mm. most suffering. Kinsey, I'm wondering whether Posh and Bex regret opening this Pandora's box. For years they've been perceived as the perfect couple and people had forgotten that uh, far from being perfect, there was infidelity in the relationship. And according to Rebecca Luz, uh, she was not the only one. I watched that docu-series and was left questioning whether or not the affairs really happened. That's how well-crafted that docu-series was. I had no idea who Rebecca Luce was, you know, until the series dropped. No fault of theirs directly because they don't name her. But you're right, it did open up old... Mm wounds that could have stayed closed and hidden. This was a, a risk that they took. They have a much bigger audience today than they did back then, thanks to streaming and social media. And you're absolutely right. I think David appears to be guilty of some infidelity based on Luce's reaction. Um, do I think it'll hurt the brand overall? I don't know because I don't think so because I think most people go, well, it was back then. And that docuseries, again, was so glossy and well-produced um, that you go, oh, well, they're over it now. Uh, but you're right. They did this to themselves. They invited this negativity with this docuseries. Mm. It is a long time ago, but I do remember at the time, uh, and I can't recall any denials from the pair when the story first came out. And I think there was all sorts of even text message exchanges that were published uh, way, way back then. Now, I think I speak for the overwhelming majority of the sane world when I say we're thoroughly sick and tired of Taylor and Travis. Can we just forget about this? So I'm going to announce here now, unless something dramatic happens, this will be the last time we will speak of this. Kinsey, you have my <laughs> word on this, but we've uh, we've got a report uh, this... <laughs> Swift was watching Travis Kelsey play again over the weekend and she has been rehearsing her halftime entertainment with the wife of the Chiefs' biggest star, Patrick Mahomes. To Marquez, Valdez, Gantling. Uh, Kinsey, please tell me the buzz is dying down on this or are people still fascinated by this uh, rare love story? I think that the cringiest part of that video is when uh, Brittany Mahomes misses her cue and Taylor's like, come on, we got to do it. We got to do this thing. We clearly rehearsed in the, in the, in the yeah. girls' bathroom in the VIP area. <laughs> uh, you know, Rita, this is, a, this is a win that the NFL has so desperately needed. Oh, you know, 53% of, of viewership up amongst teenage girls, uh, over uh, almost 30,000 viewers watching these Chiefs games. And let me tell you where the NFL lost people is when they fully got behind the Black Lives Matter movement. They turned away a lot of people mm. that were committed to the NFL and these teams. And now these teenage girls are going, hey, Dad, we got to watch the game. I have to see what Taylor's wearing. If, if she's wearing a bracelet dedicated to her new boyfriend, what Travis is wearing, what celebrity oh, friends God. Taylor's bringing. And they, this is an, an a win for the NFL. So hopefully they've learned their lesson. They kind of got bud lighted. Uh, and taking a, a political side too aggressively. And, um, you know, hopefully they'll they'll go for some more wholesome and, and, you know, wholesome content in the future. Well, until it all ends in tears and Taylor writes another album about how terrible Travis was. You're which, done. Which is the best part of the whole thing. That's, that's what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> but it just shows you how everything's connected. You mentioned Bud Light there, and uh, Bud Light did try to rebuild their image with... Travis Kelsey. He was featured in, in an ad. Uh, it was a terrible ad. I don't think it did it repaired any of the damage they've caused themselves, but uh, good on them for trying. Kinsey Schofield, always a pleasure. Thank you.